Hi guys, welcome to the next episode of our discussion program. Uh, but before we go into it, I would really like you guys to check out our Africa course, Know Your Afro Purpose. It is a digital course that deals with all things Africa. So you get to learn about ancient African history as well as modern African history, African culture, uh, you get to discover your Afro purpose and your inherent African nature and find out about your hidden talents which we can bring out to the fore in this course. So if you want um, extended descriptions on what the course is, please check out the links below the video uh, and in the meantime, enjoy the show. Karibuni. Yeah, and I think it's also important to mention the fact that there was very little like intertribal skirmishes and warfare. Yeah. Um, because everything was interconnected and communities depended on themselves. So that was the system of life, uh, like a brief compendium of the system of life before what we now call colonialism came about. Yeah, yeah. So enter the three horsemen and the three bedfellows of colonialism, yeah. imperialism and capitalism. Which is uh, just off the whole Berlin co um, conference. Yes, um, 1884 and, to 1885 we had the Berlin conference, yeah. which later came to be termed the scramble for Africa. Yeah. And uh, the most rapacious of all the rulers, uh, a man by the name of King Leopold, the notorious King Leopold, who subsequently went on to colonize uh, Belgian Congo, we call it Belgian Congo, like, you know, before it, <laughs> but anyway, uh, he had a quote famously from uh, the Berlin Conference of 1884 to 1885 that he wanted, quote, a piece of this magnificent African cake. Yeah, lots of resources to be had. But I think, you know, back to the, why we're having this conversation, which is really the psychology of racism. And I love what you've covered at the beginning, which is to create a picture for everyone that, um, you know, African societies were not black. Stuff was happening, um, and if you look, it was a vibrant community. It was a vibrant community. There were huge, huge civilizations that had been there even way before in the Middle Ages. Um, just if you go to the Greater Zimbabwe ruins, you know these are there's a huge cluster of walls um, that are very architecturally strong um, and indicate a very strong civilization that was very developed. You know the pyramids of Egypt were not built contrary to popular belief by the Arabs that currently occupy Egypt. Those places were built actually by black Africans. Um, some of the oldest libraries were in places like Kumali. So rich, in Alexandria. yeah, yes. in Alexandria. And, and these places were run by blacks. And I think the other thing we don't talk about is how the fact that Moors, for example, ruled the southern part of Europe for many years. For 700 that, years, For actually. 700 years. So yeah, this is not great. discussed and talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and if they could do that, it means they had a very strong military capability. They had a very strong technological... Naval capabilities as well. Naval capability, technological capability. Uh, things like mathematics that would help triangulate and get them to their destination. So Africa was not this kind of blank place where people were running dressless, clothesless, um, and without direction. So that's a very good point to put in there. But I think then now coming back to, um, you know, now colonial... Just to interject quickly, yeah. like uh, everything Edge is talking about, there's a brilliant book by two authors called Thomas Brophy and uh, Robert Beauvoir called Black Genesis in terms of uh, talking about the prehistoric kind of roots and cultures that existed in Africa, yeah. especially to do with uh, the building of the pyramids. So like we keep emphasizing, uh, do your own research, but look up those books as well that we yeah. recommend while we're having this discussion and also inform us as well of anything else that you feel that we might have forgotten. But Edge brings up a very uh, important point in terms of the pride and the civilizations and the te technological advancements yes. that we needed to have in order to build those magnificent wonders such as the pyramid. But exactly, yeah. 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 You know, and that's why sometimes I get really, there's, there's a lot of, uh, I guess, um, little nuggets of uh, information shared through the social media now around uh, slave, slaves in America who actually created a lot of the machines we use today. Things like the washing machine apparently was initially thought out conceptualized by a black person, a black slave, and then later on became the washing machine. But it's not very far away from where these slaves came from. They came from a continent that was actually quite advanced. So it's very important, first of all, to take this conversation from that level of understanding. But then also the bit that we then need to look at is, you know, following this Berlin conference where we were now getting into what is called the scramble of Africa. Uh, I think there's a kind of thought process that we don't take into account uh, before that, which is 
in Europe, there had been a redesigning of Europe. There had been a movement from the feudal system uh, where you had serfs, and these serfs were there to build the kingdoms of these royal families and the monarchies that were there at that time. And the monarchies had done a very good job, which are the bloodlines, because monarchies, people think monarchies are like, you know, kings that were chosen or battled it out, and but they were actually very specific bloodlines. Yes. And they propagated themselves within those bloodlines. And they, they made sure that they stuck within those bloodlines, come hell or come high hell, water, exactly. because they were, that's what they were called blue bloods. They were, they were called blue bloods. And yeah. so that purity of bloodlines was very important. Um, and, and, and just by keeping that purity, they were able to convince the local population that they were actually chosen by God and that they actually had the power of God and that's why. The divine right of kings. The divine right yeah. of kings. And so the serfs got fed up. They realized there's a story here. And um, I think there's a great story in Robin Hood uh, where you see you know, the taxman would come and collect for the king and the church would have the friar coming to collect the tithe. And you had these serfs who were then very impoverished because of this feudal system. And so now they were redesigned because they started to fight for their own rights. You had obviously the um, entrenchment of the British constitution or the, the, the formation of the British constitution. And so you now had people who had civil liberties, civil rights. They needed to be redesigned and they were indeed redesigned um, to become uh, ready for the industrial revolution that was sure to come as the rationalization age started to kick in um, and people now became thinkers, became scientists. So this stuff then became the blue collar worker, the white collar worker who was going to drive a lot of this industrial growth. Um, but then to drive this dominion, these monarchies therefore also needed to take over the world. They had a tendency and a predisposition to want to own the resources of the world. And so there's a gen like a genesis of exploring, you know, Columbus apparently discovered America. Again, the concept that this place was blank and lights were out until Columbus landed and was able to illuminate and bring back information. Um, the story that's always told from the perspective of the white people. Um, so you had that uh, process of exploration and a discovery of, wow, out there, there's a lot of resources, there's a lot of stuff that we can take advantage of. And literally, those communities don't have the same systems that we do. Um, and we think that our systems can actually overlay uh, those lands quite well. So after exploration was now the imperialism that kicked in. And people everywhere, from Portugal to the, to the UK. In so fact, what you find happening is that the cousin of Spain yes. and the cousin of Britain are kings. Yes. And they are both cousins. And they're both. And the, the, that interrelationship was happening all throughout European exactly. monarchies. The fact that even, for example, Queen Elizabeth and uh, Prince Philip are somehow distantly related, and although they are married, um, you know, but you had this family. Prince Philip, to... actually, sorry to interrupt, but is, is actually Greek. So he, he's actually Greek. He was a prince. Yes, exactly. So that just reinforces your point. Exactly, because there was a Saxa Coburg Gotha in Greece as well. So all this, um, these interrelationships with people like George the Fifth. I think George the Fifth would have been, quote and unquote, the first king. For example, Kenya had in East Africa because um, he took over and was now the emperor of India as well as. Uh, the, the, the British uh, em, um, emperor, but also, of course, took up the colonies that were British East Africa at that time. But he was a Saxa Coburg Gotha, and there was a plan. There was a plan that these families had to take over the world. And just as an interesting anecdote, I think it's important to mention that George V's grandfather, George III, was, was a, a nut He was a nutcase. <laughs> he was a nutcase. <laughs> and he was, he was a nutcase who was, <laughs> up until uh, Queen Elizabeth II, he was the longest serving monarch. How many years did you do? I think it was from 1760 to 1820, so 16 years. Six, 60 years, sorry. 60 years, yeah. Six zero. Six 60 zero, years. Yeah. So but actually, you had Queen a Victoria, mm. Queen Victoria actually did 63 years. Ah, yes, so he was the second. second he was the second, so it was, yes. it was Queen Victoria with 63 and then him and then with 60. Him, and then and then of course now we've got Elizabeth II who's done quite a bit. Of so, like, just to give a brief summation of those excellent points, what you're saying is, like, there was an intersection between the feudal system of life yeah. in Europe and the onset of industrialization. Yeah. And so the powers that be, these Western imperialist powers, made sure that they had to introduce a system because these quote-unquote serfs yeah. were becoming aware of their suppression. And so... They redesigned them. They had to redesign them. So the idea that the white person is more free than the black person, I think that's really what's important to understand is mm. 
we are all embedded within a system of imperialism, a system of global control. And that's the context through which I think we need to look at racism, rather than looking at it in terms of the black experience alone. Um, if you look at what the yellow coats were going through in France uh, recently, um, and in fact these yellow coats were actually permeating all over Europe, people protesting against this system, uh, the, is because the white, the yes, yellow vests, yes, yes, the yes, yellow yes. vests, sorry, yeah. and, and, and it's because they've also come to see that this system is oppressive to them as well. So it was a system of domination, it was a system of control, and it was actually anchored at monarchies. So we're all part of the same process, it's just that we've probably been divided up by gradient. So if you now overlay that imperialistic ambition of these monarchies to take over the world, you needed instruments. First of all, you needed a technology. What was this technology? It was things like the rail, the medical developments, the science that they actually developed over time that they would then use when they went out into these countries to take over. You had to be very strong militarily to be able to seize control of some of these nations. So off they went and they, and they took over the world because they wanted to um, use those resources to build their own monarchies and to maintain their control and dominion. Um, and so the capitalist system is what we always talk about as a system that was created out of this um, and in fact has actually driven a lot of the racial um, interactions we experience today where people feel marginalized and uh, racially discriminated against. But remember, you're just part of a gradient because the white person was the blue collar worker who was more skilled and able to get it, able to execute and also be the eyes of these monarchies. But, um, and the brown person, if you look at the Asian communities and how they were taken over, it was slightly different in the sense that they were not the bigger bodied people. And so they, they were not seen as, perhaps as physically capable as to undertake physically, some of the, exactly. the burdensome tasks exactly. that had to be carried out, like building the railways. Like building the railways. Although the, some Indians did help in building, building the railways. They did, but, they did, but yes. they were, you know, they were, in fact, even the jobs they were doing were slightly higher up, yeah. because you could hire the locals to do all the heavy lifting, because they were stronger and bigger and so on. And even the slaves that were <coughs> the Americas were people who were obviously a lot bigger and could, and could withstand hard labor. Um, and that's not to say that any of those communities were any, you know, dumber. It was just a system that was very specific about what it needed from you as a human being. And very deliberate. And very deliberate and very intentional. So racism is not a happenstance. It's not something that happened quite by mistake. It's something in terms of a meeting of a family, of a, a lineage, a bloodline, deciding this is how we're going to dominate the world. And restructure. And these are the people available to us to make it happen. So they redesigned the European to be their eyes, but you know what? They, they designed the Asian and the African and other indigenous groups around the world to be the hard workers who are actually going to build their, their economies. And that's where we are dealing with racism. So the European or the, uh, or the eyes? Yeah. And the rest of us were the limbs. And doesn't it work that way if you <laughs> yeah. look at, for example, today, if you just fast forward that to today, and you look at the investment of foreign companies here, who is the CEO? Most likely, it's a white person, because yeah. he can adjudicate over the wealth of the monarchies they represent. Um, and then, you know, you can just get the Africans to do the lower, more meaningless, menial, task. <laughs> menial tasks. Yeah. So the system still works. So it's very important for us to look at racism, not as, I know there was a debate you and I were having, is, is it institutional racism? Is it systemic? Yeah. Um, and this is something that I think Toure was trying to bring out around racism being a very subtle experience. Kwame Toure. Kwame Toure, yeah. sorry, yeah. Being, you know, saying it's, it's you know, something that we subtly experience because we are not able to get the same level of service from institutions. No, 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 no. Institutions are entities. There yes. are people behind those entities who are driving the matrix, who are driving this system. Like the foundation, I guess. And laying the foundation yeah. for the discussion. We now move on to East Africa. Yeah. And the colonial system that we had. Yeah which was a system of colonial settlement. Yeah, direct we colonial call, settlement. Exactly, yeah. or direct British rule. Yeah, or direct French rule. Or direct French rule, yeah. Because like Burundi and Rwanda in this region. Exactly. Um, those who were under the French rule. Yeah, or yeah. the Belgian rule. Well. Or the Belgian rule, yeah. Yeah, so in terms of East Africa, we had, uh, as opposed to West Africa, which we will deal with in another section, we had a system of direct British rule or colonial settlement. And so, and maybe just to interject, Pedro, the reason why that was is because there was no kind of delegated authority that could be readily used in the East African um, area. You yeah. know, there were no like chiefs 
Yeah. Uh, in West Africa, I think they had the chiefs that will cover that. Exactly. Well, uh, the, the system in West Africa was much more conducive to that kind of system because the standing of chiefs in West African society was very high, very markedly prevalent. Yeah. Whereas in East Africa, and also purely for the reason, the, one of the main reasons actually why we had this system of direct British rule was because of the fat fertility of our land. Of course. So the British thought, okay, um, this is very fertile land. We have a lot of settlers who can come in there and do a lot of the administrative work that would have otherwise been undertaken by the indigenous African populations, which is what happened in West Africa. Yeah. So what happened was the British came over. They had a their, their economic system was purely based on introducing a kind of a monoculture in terms of agriculture. Yeah, commercial so, farming. Commercial farming, and usually what that entailed was concentrate concentrating purely on one crop. Yeah. In East Africa, it tended to be primarily tea or perhaps coffee. So in Kenya, it was tea. And so what happened was that uh, this brought about a system of, of forced, forced uh, specialization, which meant that there was no diversity in terms of agricultural produce. But uh, putting that aside, the economic system that they kind of introduced, which was, uh, which was an anathema yeah. to our uh, culture, yeah. was uh, forced labor. Yeah was the building of railways purely to transport those uh, raw minerals that they needed from the coast to the hinterland and to the inner lands. Yeah. Um, the, this system of like European settlers controlling agricultural production yeah. as opposed to the indigenous population, yeah. which meant that the proceeds from, that, from those uh, agricultural goods were of course going directly back to Britain. They were building. So yeah. they were, this system was created to build their hegemony, their power globally. They needed to build back into the center in terms of moving resources from the colonies that had taken over into the center again, redistributing those for whatever purpose, just in the same way that they redistributed slaves, uh, people, human capital. Um, so they needed to build the center, but they also then needed to exploit um, the resources at source, and yes. they needed somebody to administer. Again, the white people, their eyes, those were the people who settled in Kenya, uh, for example, and became the eyes of the monarchy at, yes. the, at their majesty's service. Exactly, and uh, I think it's also important to mention the fact that this kind of forced labor, uh, a lot of it was displaced from rural uh, communities. So, whereas previously, before people were, were dealing with the more subsistence level of agricultural produce, yeah. purely for collective subsistence in terms of the community. Many of them were forced off their lands, uh, partly because, well, largely because a lot of their lands were being taken over by European settlers, yeah, but so also because a lot of that labor was being transported to other uh, areas of the economy, yeah. uh, mining and so forth. Exactly. So there was a lot of social displacement, which also meant to the fracturing of uh, the social, uh, relations so social relationships and so the social constructs that were... I think the minute you're able to see this system for what it is, and that it's building towards power at a centralized place, and it's recreating the world in a way that it can control the world, then you then understand that the instruments that are being used were very clear. So for the imperial process, it was the first thing was religion, you know, and I think you're going to touch on that. But you know, this was a an alien god who was white. <laughs> you know, and um, you know he was he came with his own scriptures, long hair, long hair, eyes. blue eyed. He came with his own manual called the Bible. Yeah. Um, and so, but you see, and he was an attractive god if you really think about it, because attractive he, in European eyes, you're or attractive generally. even to the African, because oh, yeah. the technology that the white man came with was always kind of linked back to the fact that he worshipped this very powerful and only god. Yes. And so that kind of synergy meant that, you know, photography, the ability to actually kill 10 people at once with a shotgun, uh, which was very different from killing 10 people with a spear. Yeah. You know, the, the, the quickness and fastness, the ability for this person to actually come into your country and actually take over and even, you know, yeah, uh, make that land produce things you've never seen. In the psychology of the African, this God was a very powerful God. So let's, let's talk about, sorry, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, so let's talk about the psychology of that religion yeah. and what that did to the psyche of uh, indigenous peoples. Because um, primarily, like you said before, you know, the whole depiction of God and Jesus was blonde-haired, blue-eyed. Yeah. And they also introduced this concept of uh, government, centralized government, which as we have said previously when discussing what uh, African society was like prior to colonialism, it was decentralized and there was no hegemony 
But they introduced this, uh, this concept that uh, government was chosen by God. And so because government was chosen by God, it was a sin to go against God's choice of government. Because well, yeah, and they sold it as obey. You've got to yeah. obey this hierarchy because God's kingdom requires you to obey. Remember the stuff in Europe? Yeah. It was just being reworked. They were just starting from the beginning again and creating the serfs they needed to govern their lordships uh, you know, off in, in Europe. So it's the same process they used. It, the, the, there was actually no difference between the friar in the middle of uh, the British uh, uh, countryside and uh, the taxman who collected the uh, coins on behalf of the, of, the, of the king. They were the same people. If the king needed to fight a war, in another country. The church would have enough money to actually fund the king and they would actually be the ones who would be passing information between the warring because you know they were that ubiquitous. They were one and the same person. I think like in my language one of the things we say is there is no white man and the priest they are one and the same person. They are one and the same person. So the priest came with this religion where it's, it's, this is a very high god who comes with a lot of technology and a lot of advancement and that way he was attractive. But this is the thing, for you to know this God, you needed something else, which again, this system has very, you know, has taken time to think through, which is education. For you to read the Bible, you needed to be able to read and write in the language of these guys. And so introduced, uh, introduced Africans to an educational system that is a programming. You know, education, we now know in hindsight, is a, is a programming that happens. It's a psychological programming. When I begin to show you facts that work true, you know, that I've created things like penicillin, and if you swallow penicillin, your infection goes down. That's really great stuff, you know, that is really great stuff. So if I can build the credibility of my system through this education system, you will believe it. And even if I put a lot of untruths in it, you will believe it. So for example, this is why, as Africans, we are actually taught that we are an inferior race, and we still believe it. In fact, we even, even go ahead and look at each other and say, ah, this tribe uh, is a bit inferior because they don't have this. We, we use the same classification system that was used against us because of how compelling this system of education was. So they've got you programmed in an education system that will help you access their very powerful God. And in this whole process is to make you obey a structure, to believe in the order of the political structure that ah, have. Now, let me interrupt you yeah. there, because we're going to come back to the significance of the use of language, and especially yeah. how that was used as a tool of control by the colonial and imperialist powers. Yeah. But just coming back slightly to this issue of religion, I think it's also very important to point out the fact that um, it was inculcated and drummed within us as a, a native people uh, and as a people of the land that the spirituality that we practiced prior to the introduction of quote-unquote Christianity yeah. were pagan practices exactly. and were somehow demonic and went against God's wishes. You know, once that idea of God uh, was introduced into our culture, they made sure that through their Christian missionaries that they inculcated within us this belief that what we were doing was not true, and was I'll, evil. I'll, Pedro, I'll shock you. I think yeah. it was in 1904. In the colony of Kenya, uh, witchcraft was actually legally banned. Yes. Now, what was witchcraft? It gave them an opportunity to frame you, to frame you as a, as a, as a Kenyan, whatever ethnic group you were, um, uh, passing on important medical information because they wanted you to go into their medical dispensaries. It stopped you from passing information about contracts and the way you relate with other communities in terms of just what we covered at the beginning, you know, those communal contracts, those communal discussions. You couldn't pass that on because then it's easy for you to be the, the local witch doctor um, and then for you to be persecuted for that. So it gave them an inroad legally actually to begin to kill off a lot of these cultural structures that helped to keep the African communities cohesive. Um, and then in there they could begin to create division. In there they could begin to create division and also begin to change your identity as a person, because if you don't understand your roots, if you don't understand who you are, if you have no way of passing on this information, if all this information is being made to look false and dark, um, then you're really kind of, you have no foundation. And just it's jumping in there, yeah. uh, I think it's also important to mention the fact that it also disconnected us from our roots uh, in terms of uh, our connection to nature. Yes. Because a lot of these religions 
uh, religions. A lot of these uh, spiritual practices that we undertook and we, that, that we partook in exactly. prior to colonialism gave us a natural connection to the land. Exactly. And so that uh, full court press of religion and the white god, coupled also with the industrialization of the land for their economic purposes, yeah. made sure that that, uh, this, that disconnection uh, between us and the land and our very nature was almost complete. Exactly, and if you look at the anthropological kind of studies of the communities, especially in East Africa, um, for example, initiation. If you want, if you are a Maasai being initi initiated, you had to actually go out there and do a, some sort of hunt. Well, you can't do that if all the land has been cordoned off and owned by a commercial farmer. Exactly. And it's the same thing amongst the Kikuyus where, you know, especially in the emergency period, you had people being moved out of their land and being put into villages. And then they would go, uh, you know, bef during the open hours before the curfew to tend to their land and come back with the food. Now, um, that meant that certain activities couldn't also be done. Things like the initiation of men was really taking a toll. It had to take place during the day and it had to be controlled because everybody had to get back to the village. It was interfering with the way that we used land and the way that we integrated ourselves into the land. And that was actually causing a lot of resentment. Um, and the other thing about land is that whereas before it was communal, now it's owned. It's now then partitioned in particular ways. Um, it's depersonalized. It's depersonalized. Well. Because before we had that connection to the land, yes. we belonged to the community. We are alien now it's to become community. an economic commodity. Commodity. Um, it has to be productive in, a, in, a, in, in the definition of the white man, which is extractive. It's extractive. It was never about you giving back to nature. So things like permaculture was something that was used where you cross plant with the forest. Yeah, exactly. But now you need to clear a forest to create this cash crop. Mm. So what happened was that they introduced this culture of uh, individualism and this acquisitive kind of tradition exactly. where things have to be hoarded and things have to be kept, kept. purely for economic purposes. In, purely for economic purposes. And, and it's true, some Africans actually saw the value of that. And it isn't uh, a mistake. This system, what it does is it creates successes. You know, just we, we were talking about the prime minister of, um, is, it, is it of Mali who died before um, he could then take yes. over. So, so success are, that exactly, they have to be created and they have to buy into the system. If they're not buying into the system, then who else can take over? So these concepts still exist. So this system was creating a layer of Africans who were alienated from their land, alienated from their culture, taking up the education of this new uh, person, taking up the religion of this new person, um, and of course uh, adopting the idea of hoarding and enriching oneself to retain strength and power. Individualism. Individualism. Yes. Before we, we leave the topic of religion, I think it's also important to mention this one aspect. And that is that aspect in terms of which is very particular to Christianity, which is uh, this doctrine of endure for now, for you shall see the fruits of your labor when you die and go to heaven. And labor being a very functional word in that way. Labor being a very <laughs> functional word in this whole construct. So yeah. the whole idea was, um, okay, listen, because all that does really is to reinforce the whole indentured servitude and slavery concept. Exactly. Because the doctrine of Christianity uh, actually came hand in hand with capitalism yes. in many ways. So yeah. what they're trying to tell us is, okay, your life might be a complete dump at the moment. But in terms of the teachings of Jesus Christ and, and one biblical day teachings, you go to heaven. one day you'll go to heaven. So life here on earth might be hell, hell on earth literally. But uh, endure, remain humble, be subservient, don't question authority, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. In fact, that is the very path yeah. to this heaven, exactly. to this wonderful heaven. In fact, that is, that is such a good point because they try to convince us that that is the path. The path of subservience, servitude, servility. But what, you know when you say that, that's so powerful because it just makes me reflect on that a little in terms of the reason why we can't overturn this system in quite the way, you know, right now we've got Black Lives Matter. We want to hold up placards and say, defund the police, um, uh, you know, tackle this whole issue of racism from a point of fighting the institutions that have uh, propagated this racism. Mm. The reason I think we can't also get out of that is because we don't know what it's like to be human. We lost our, our, human, our yes. identity as human. The African culture, 
allowed you to mingle with the land in a way that reminded you that you were part and parcel of a greater ecosystem. Yeah. In fact, if you look at the religions of that time, they still had one God. If you look at, like, for example, the Kikuyu culture in Kenya, um, they had one God who sat on a mountain. This is the God who gave you rain. This is the God who gave you children. This is the God who gave you whatever you were eating. And he, this is the God who gave you peace. He's also the God who gave you the strength to overcome any enemy that was coming at you. So already that was in place. But you, it's knew, funny you, that actually. you knew that by actually being part of nature and living life as a simple human being. This system came in to actually cut you off from that. Um, so we actually don't know how to be not workers. We are either our profession, we are either um, we have a space and place in, in this system that is named and slotted out. It's a little cubicle for you. And so we don't actually know what it means to live this life where we are actually just natural human beings. And yeah. that's probably why we can't break it. That's very true. And uh, what you're talking about is something that has been coined the, the Euro-Christian capitalist work ethic, yeah. which is basically that system of making work sure hard. that... Yeah, work hard, uh, be individualistic, uh, maintain that acquisitive nature at the expense of others. Because yeah. capitalism can only really work uh, at the expense of others. And, and the collaborative spirit of the African cultures was lost, was which was exactly. actually even more beneficial because you would have something I don't, mm -hmm. and we could exchange happily on that. Mm -hmm. um, it's very interesting that you were talking about the, the disconnection uh, from the land. Yeah. I saw a very interesting meme uh, this week somewhere on social media, which was talking about the ego system, yeah. which is capitalism versus the ecosystem. Yes. And yes. In the ego system. That's amazing. That's uh, a really good point. Exactly. There, there was a pyramid and atop the pyramid was man. Yeah. So it was a figure of a man. And then just in the pyramid shape was everything that followed below that. So you had cattle and you had your servants and you had this and that. Whereas in the ecosystem, which yeah. is in the African culture, it was circular. And if you notice in terms of African culture, even in terms of our archi architectural um, was, constructs, yeah. Everything was conical or circular or dome shaped because that symbolized the whole or oneness. oneness. The Whereas, cyclicalness and the wholeness of being entrenched in God's creation as a human person. Yeah. yeah. So to bring it back now to like kind of like the psychology of racism. Yeah. 